16 people here, I appreciate that. Um, so I've, I've been in tech for a, about 10 years. Uh, prior to that, and, and, and this will tie in a second, um, I taught physics and chemistry at a college in Florida. Um, <clears throat> part of the enjoyable part about that is obviously getting to move from you know, more of an academic background to then moving into the tech part of the background. You find that one of the more effective things you'll do is the ability to hopefully convey knowledge and convey information to other people. Um, I no longer have to work in a lab, which is definitely the best part. It was absolutely the worst part of working in academia. Um, part of working in Florida was we drove, and obviously if you guys aren't from the United States, you won't maybe understand how bad the road tripping is, right? Public transportation is terrible in the United States. So I was in <clears throat> Florida, which was way down here. This is where my home was. This is where my wife's family was from, and this is where we would stay in the summers. So grand total, every time we would be out of session, so we'd come out in the summer, we would do approximately 45 hours of driving, okay? And, and as newlyweds, we had made the, the decision early on that, you know, this was about the time when the amazing race was going on. We wanted to kind of have part of that experience in our marriage, right? So as part of one of those trials, we decided we were going to navigate with nothing but the old fashioned road atlas. No GPS, this was gonna be a low tech start off to our marriage. And we learned some really important things about each other in those first couple months, right? Um, one of the things we also did in grad school was we were adventure guides. So we did whitewater rafting, uh, we did zip lines, and, and it was our job to keep college kids alive you know, with various states of inebriation, right? And one of the things we learned is that you would see couples go on, on these outings, right? And they'd go whitewater rafting and, and you would learn a lot about their relationship as well because he's paddling into a tree and she's just screaming and freaking out and yelling at each other. And, and you've got this, this dilemma and conflict the entire time, right? Well, what I learned is that my marriage would only last for about six months if we continued using the road atlas. So we swapped over uh, to a GPS fairly quickly, one because I, uh, I ask too many questions when we're driving. You know, like when's the next turn, where are we, how long until we get there. And on a road atlas, there's only so many ways my wife can go, James, we, we've got about half a finger's worth of road left. I think it's about 75 miles, I'm really not sure. So that kind of takes us into some of the frustrations with threat modeling, right? Because people, number one, people don't understand how long are we going to be here? How long is this process? What does our destination look like? Where are my milestones? Where am I at in that process? So the, the part of threat modeling program management we're gonna focus on for today's session is gonna be our process and product side, right? I'm not gonna talk as much about the, the people side of who's doing the threat modeling. I'm gonna talk more about the process, the efficiency side, the effectiveness of threat modeling, and then ultimately, what are my final deliverables, right? What am I working towards in that process? Because if we, if we look back at the, the analogy of the road trip, right, I have, some sense of direction, I have some sense of speed, I have some sense of milestones, I understand what my final destination is going to be, and yet sometimes within our threat modeling process, people are so focused in their silo that they don't see that broader picture. They don't understand what do the milestones look like. They don't understand what's my time between point A and point B along that process. And by giving them the broader picture there, we hope to be able to deliver that. So, we're gonna go through the doing, the deliverables, and done. And, and yes, ChatGPT did generate the title for this, so I'm working with something that's maybe a little off. So when we talk about doing efficient threat modeling, when we say efficient, we mean an efficient process defined as a procedure or series of actions that achieves its intended outcome with the least amount of wasted resources, such as time, materials, energy, uh, or money, right? So when we talk about efficient threat modeling, one of the concepts I'd like to review with people is the concept of a rented security budget mindset. And the reason why you have to start with this is if I've had capital allocated to my program, I have to start from the beginning determining how I'm going to measure success in that program. Because for every dollar I'm given by the organization, I'm under the assumption that at the end of the year I have to return that money if I have not been effective with that money. So along the way, am I properly allocating those resources? And and a lot of times we wait until it's like 90 days, right, before we have to justify budget again to start talking about have we been effective. But if we build this in from the front and we start off with our rented security budget mindset, that of security stewardship, we start measuring things like how long is it taking me to threat model? 
how many design flaws are being highlighted, how many you know, mitigations have I implemented early in this process prior to them going into a production environment. Um, and we'll talk about like time and stage threat modeling later. Uh, demonstrating a need for further investment by transitioning from passive program management to active program management. So what do I mean by active versus passive? Passive programs exist, right? If your program isn't changing, you have a passive program for threat modeling. There should be some improvement initiative in process at all times. There should be something we're changing, something we're implementing, something we're improving, because then you go back and you have the justification to go, this is why we need more resources next year. This is why we're expanding upon this program because we're doing something different. We're going to grow our capacity and grow our scale. Um, high ROI threat modeling behaviors, right? Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll talk about is, is the ability to have a very, very well-defined scope. And this was identified this morning as well. Great threat models do not have to be 65,000 components, right? If I'm only looking at one small incremental change and the result of, of examining that change is a, is a net reduction in risk to the organization or net re reduction in risk to that application or to that business line, have I completed a, a good threat model? Is it a great threat model? Maybe no. But am I making progress in the right direction? What I found by working with organizations is that you will have people who will sit there and they will struggle with the perfect representation of a system. Perfect representation does not a good threat model make. It does not reduce risk, right? And we'll talk, when we get into the value side, we'll talk more about reduced margin returns. Um, and by breaking those into things like templates, right? If, if I've got a very common piece of infrastructure, and I'll talk about you know, layered threat modeling in, in different layers, but if I've got a very consistent environmental layer where if I'm inside of AWS, I'm inside of the cloud, those things rarely change, and they're certainly not gonna change because I'm introducing a new application. I then have my infrastructure, my EC2 instances are very same, my S3 buckets are being deployed the same way. Those things aren't going to change. I wanna spend the most of my time looking at that third functional layer where why is this web application different than this web application, right? These are the areas where I start to receive the, the net benefits by focusing specifically on the functional differences between two different applications. But up until that point, I can leverage things like templates where I've already built this, I've already pre-assessed many of these controls. As long as I'm following the exact same execution process, the same deployment process, I can leverage pre-made templates to jumpstart and kickstart that threat model. Because if I've gone through and pre-assessed that with a team of people who own that environment, and I've, I've spent five hours doing it, that's five hours returned to the next threat model. And then if we improve it further, that's additional time that gets returned for every additional threat model there, therefore and beyond. Um, prioritize threats, uh, threats and threats. Prioritize threats and mitigations, right? Making sure we do have a prioritization process. Um, having, and by the way, that implies that you have a written mechanism of why you're prioritizing what you're prioritizing. Are you prioritizing by quantity of records? Are you prioritizing by hops to egress point? Relative proximity to trust zone, or uh, trust zone egress, right? How are you prioritizing what you're looking at in your threat model? Do you have a risk algorithm that's just telling you what to do? Or do you enable developers or enable security engineer to, to look at that and make a decision and say, well, this is what we normally would have done, but because I feel this is a larger risk, I'm going to change how I address the, the prioritization in this model, okay? Value add reporting. Um, I heard Power BI mentioned earlier, uh, I'm a huge advocate of reporting on what matters. Uh, and I say that as the guy who used to be the data guy, the number of times I've delivered a urgent Friday report for it not to be read or not to be read for a week is incredibly high, right? Do not ask for reporting that you are not going to read. Do not ask for reporting you are not gonna make decisions on, okay? Value add reporting. If it does not add value to my threat modeling process, we should not be reporting on it. And, and let alone requiring people to go out and collect data, organize data, and report on that data for us, okay? Uh, and that's why, again, solutions like Power BI plugging into you know, threat repos and, and things like that so you can see what the current status is about having to generate those reports, um, very valuable. So achieving scalable returns. Uh, borrowing from some of the uh, threat modeling manifesto capabilities model, uh, a couple of these I love, right? So education, building a team of security champions and evangelists. If you want to scale your program, you can't go out and replicate your shining star threat modeler. Okay, that security engineer is far too expensive. Uh, we're not gonna find another one. 
necessarily, especially in a short period of time. We do it by building evangelists and building additional champions and building a street of champions. Is everything I think everyone here agrees on that process. How we get there, I think, changes from organization to organization as your culture changes, depending on where you are, what the quality of the, the engineering team you're working with. Uh, it is an active practice. Uh, creating additional threat models, having format consistency. Uh, if you're threat modeling in silos and you've decided to have a more decentralized threat modeling process, have similar consistencies from threat model to threat model. If someone moves from team to team inside your organization, do they need to be retrained? Do they need to be retaught how to threat model because someone's doing it in Microsoft PowerPoint or some, and someone's using Microsoft Threat Model or someone's using Miro, right? What's the process, what's the tooling? Um, having a tool assisted process, uh, actioning on threat models, have a well-defined definition of done. Uh, and we'll talk about time boxing a little bit later. Um, having baseline improvement. So if I have some baseline, and again, this is where we talk about active management versus passive management, I want to have some kind of performance improvement plan on my threat modeling process at all times. Something needs to be improved. Um, it, was, it was interesting to hear Lean talked about this morning. If you go through and map out the items which actually generate value in your threat modeling program, so things which, which march toward uh, the creation of uh, prioritized risks, threats, countermeasures, and ultimately the reduction of risk, if they do not align with that, we should be openly calling out those items and attempting to, to remove them from our process. <clears throat> so how important is efficiency without effectiveness? Right? Uh, it reminds me of the joke of the guy adding, uh, you know, he, he put on his resume that he could do large math in his head. Right? And then someday once somebody asked him to prove that, you know, he had this just ginormous number and he, and he spouts out a number and of course it's wrong. And the guy said, well, I said I could do math in my head. I didn't say it was quick. Right? He can do it very fast, he can do it in his head, but it's not effective, it's not, it's not actual math. So when we think about efficiency, we can't just be efficient, we also have to be effective. And there's a lot of things where we talk about, you know, will it scale? I can do anything once. I can create one threat model in a bad way, and I can be very effective. But when we start talking about creating 10 threat models in a year, 20 threat models in a year, then we have to start talking about efficiency. But depending on where you're coming from, the first goal I think we look for is effective threat models. Because I can create 100 threat models that are all bad. Maybe that's not the direction we want to go. Right? So we, obviously we have to marry these concepts up. We can't just be quick. We can't just be efficient with our resources. We also have to move on to effective. And I apologize, this is, this is a bit hard to read. But So we look at the definition of effective threat modeling. Threat modeling is a proactive assessment of risk. Proactive meaning that we're doing it ahead of time, you know, early in our design phase or just before risk can occur, which starts with a well-scoped description of change, results in a prioritized list of realistic threats, a prioritized set of effective mitigations with a timeline and plan for risk reduction. Okay, and, I, and I'm probably weaving in a little bit of project management here, but all of these items in here, this is an irreducibly complex process. If I take away prioritization of threats or prioritization of uh, what was the phrase I used? Effective mitigations, cost-effective mitigations. If I remove any piece of this, my threat modeling program starts to fall apart. Because either A, I've got this exhaustive list of threats and I have no function and no process for how to prioritize them, and I'm trying to execute against everything all at the same time, which means I'm not hitting the most important threats, or I've got a, a, a huge list of countermeasures and, I, and no one's even gone through and assessed the potential cost of those countermeasures to the organization. I, don't, I haven't determined which one's the most important or I don't have a timeline and plan. Timeline and plan would indicate that we have people assigned to those items, we have someone following up on those items, and the number of times that this lives in a spreadsheet or this lives inside of a document that isn't being followed up on, isn't being actioned, isn't being reviewed on a consistent basis, isn't being tracked to completion, uh, and then ultimately what's our goal, right? Risk reduction. The goal is not beautiful diagrams. And I love a beautiful diagram as much as the next person, but the goal is risk reduction, and I think we have to keep that in mind. Right? Because if we've gone through and we've generated even a, a bad looking diagram with a less accurate description of change, if we're moving towards that, that's always our goal. So um, what does effective threat modeling look like? Organizational effectiveness versus industry effectiveness. Uh, I've had people argue with me on, well, our organization does a really, really good job. Okay? 
sometimes that doesn't matter if your industry does, it defines effectiveness differently, right? And if you're in a regulated industry, obviously one of your external stakeholders has defined what effectiveness looks like for you. And this is always the, the challenging part with threat modeling is with compliance-driven threat modeling, there's a lot of things you'll do that don't offer direct value towards the reduction of risk. Right? We've always got check boxes to, 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 to check off here. We've got things we have to go through that don't directly contribute to that. So what is good for you, you may have to expand that scope to include you know, what the industry says is effective. Um, scale to the organization. This was the whole will it blend concept. Um, if you guys remember that YouTube series probably 15 years ago where the guy would have this industrial blender and he would drop an iPhone into this blender. And he's trying to sell you this really, really high grade blender. And he would drop in an iPhone, hit the button, and it would liquefy an iPhone. I mean, it just, this is massive commercial blender. And he would ask the question, will it blend? And the answer was always yes. I mean, he would put an iPad in there, right? And it would just liquefy this iPad. With threat modeling, you have to ask the question, will it scale? And you have to ask that periodically as you go through these different types of changes. Um, because many of the items we'll do on a small scale won't work when you're doing a thousand threat models a year. Realistic and prioritized threats aligned to the organizational appetite. Um, again, having a process for, for determining what is going to be on that prioritized list. Having a, a mechanism for how we, how we prioritize our, our threat process. Um, prioritize risk reduction plan of action and milestones. How are we determining which ones are going to be uh, in our six month plan? How many of them are gonna be done before this thing can go into production? Are we there yet? Um, you can't tell, but this is a picture of my family and my kids, um, generated off ChatGPT. I now have two kids, uh, which means we don't road trip near as much as we used to because my daughter can ask this question every five minutes and she will not get tired, okay? And what I've learned about this and, and, and what I'm learning about threat modeling is that my daughter is too short to see out the windows, right? She has no idea where we are. She has no idea what the process looks like. She has no idea what the destination looks like. She has no real concept of we've been in the car for six hours, right? No idea. And yet, sometimes we're threat modeling in isolation and we don't know what the larger process looks like either. So when we start talking about how long are we spending for time and stage, right? Using something like time boxing and, and having a limited amount of time that I spend on something forcing me to prioritize what's most important, right? And here's just an example. If I break down to, you know, the four questions are what are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we gonna do about it? Do we do a good job? And I break these into different gates where at the end of what are we working on, I should have a security impacting and focused scope where I've documented what am I working on and what does it look like? And if I said, if I'm gonna spend four hours, if you had four hours to spend on documenting a change, could I do that? Most of the time, yes. I may have to generate several smaller threat models over that time period, but I'm breaking them into small manageable chunks because when I look at this, I know, hey, at the end of this week, am I gonna have a threat model? Yeah, because I've broken it into smaller chunks and I'm working with smaller and smaller teams. Instead of bringing 65 of us together to generate a threat model that takes six weeks, I've broken it into much smaller changes. The assessment of threats, what can go wrong? If I gave you four hours to generate a set of threats, a set of realistic, high value threats against the threat model, could you do it? Manually, probably. With a threat catalog, absolutely. Because I've got some repeatability. Using a template where I've already pre-threat modeled the environmental and infrastructure layer, oh absolutely, because someone's already done most of the work for me. I've got some, some senior security engineer looking over my shoulder you know, providing me with that information. Absolutely. And then I go into what I think is probably the most important part is finding effective risk-based, cost-effective prioritized controls, determining what's the appropriate way to reduce my risk. Because there's any given number of threats, but then prioritize them and coming up with that effective plan. And here I've assigned a 12-hour period, right? A couple half days. And then I have at the end to determine, have I been effective? I've got one hour, right? And again, this is a very small threat model. I don't expect this to be the threat model of your entire ecosystem. But by breaking those threat models into much smaller, smaller manageable chunks, I have the ability to go through my threat modeling process in a more effective way. Now, what is value, okay? Value being, number one, stakeholder aligned. Who am I threat modeling for? Um, in a regulated industry, I will normally ask the question, what does an auditor expect to see? What does my compliance person expect to see? Because I want to give them exactly what they're expecting and not a ton more. 
I don't want them asking questions. I don't, I'm not looking for a dialogue. I'm looking for a yes, I like it, I'm gonna move on, okay? What are they expecting to see? What are their needs? And then more importantly, why are there those needs? Okay, if I have the why, then that allows me to make maybe small changes to my model over time. Because there's a lot of things that I think we could probably do more effective, but if the FDA is not expecting that on your threat model, you're about to have a very long exchange with someone who maybe isn't as qualified as you to assess risk. And then we have to explain to an auditor why we chose to do things differently instead of just giving them what they're expecting. Mission aligned, why are we threat modeling? What are the actual requirements? Why do those requirements exist? And, and if we cannot answer why with substance, we should actively encourage teams to question process and requirements and drive to value. Right? Because if I can't look at, at, at a precise requirement and say, why are we doing this? Enable teams to ask that question. Look at our process and determine when can we make this process smaller. Um, the example I use when I talk about lean process, um, in the United States, you can walk into the emergency department, my, and my wife works in the emergency department, or previously did, and I will go in and maybe I'll, I'll be in the emergency department for six hours, okay? Especially if you're not in a critical case, you're gonna have to wait for a little bit. So I walk into the emergency department, I see the person at the window, they do a little pre-assessment, maybe you know, do some blood work, right? Something like that. I go back and sit in my chair, I wait a little bit longer, then maybe I'm seen by a nurse, and then I go in and I spend 15 minutes talking to her, and then maybe I go back and sit or I wait in the chair, and then I wait another hour and a doctor comes in, right? They went through and they looked at the average time that you're actually seen by a provider, and it's something like 29 minutes. 29 minutes in a six hour visit. Do we make that process work faster by telling the physician you need to work twice as hard? For that 12 minutes, cut it down to six. I've saved six minutes. Does that change my six hour visit? No. I've removed this small amount of time. What they did instead is they focused on why are you waiting? What's that waste time? And they found out, like for example, that they were sending lab results, you know, a quarter mile down the hallway to this other department to you know centrifuge and run lab results. Well, hey, what if we made the lab smaller and we put it right there in the emergency department? So you had the main lab and you had a smaller like critical triage lab. So they could run results right there inside the room without having to go you know half a mile down the road. What they found is that six hour wait time went down to a four hour wait time. Okay, well what if instead of waiting for a radiologist to wake up, what if we, what if we had someone uh, read that in a different time zone? So that person's always on, we get, we get immediate reads on lab results. But you lost another hour. But they didn't look at making people work faster. They looked at the areas that weren't value aligned with the patient. So if I start looking and applying that concept of threat modeling, where am I not working towards well scoped definition of change? Where am I not working towards prioritization of threats? Where am I not working towards a cost-effective analysis of which mitigation is most appropriate? And, and if you look at, and, and if you're not familiar with diminished marginal returns, if I look at like the value curve, right? So as my effort goes up, eventually there comes a point where if I start performing more and more and more effort, I get less and less back in return. And this is pretty common if, if I think about like working out at the gym, right? If I go to the gym, and I, and I know looking at you, you may not think that happens, but if I go to the gym and I work out for an hour, I'm gonna receive some cardiovascular benefit. If I work out for two hours, maybe a little bit more. If I work out for four, eventually the, the net benefit in that session really kind of starts to trickle off. I might even hurt myself, right? You think about diagramming with the threat model. If I've spent four hours diagramming, I may have created a good representation. What about the fifth hour? What about the sixth hour? Anyone who's ever delivered a presentation knows that maybe I have four hours, Four hours is how long it takes me to prep. If I spend another 40 hours on it, it's not gonna get that much better. Maybe a little bit, but not that much better. Same thing in threat modeling. As I go through this process and I start increasing the amount of effort I put in, I start seeing less and less returns. And if you're, and if you're never gonna visit that threat model again, man, you might need to climb all the way up that hill and slide down it. But if you're gonna embrace iterative threat modeling where I know I'm gonna go back and look at this again in the near future, I can afford to go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do four hours and I'm gonna step away and move on to something else. Because there's probably a backlog of things that need to be threat modeled that haven't been, and I can either choose to go to the 99th percentile on this one, or I can stop at 80 and then I can move on to the next threat model and get that one to 80. I can move on to the next threat model and I can get that one to 80. Because by implementing something like 
net security changes where, okay, I'm on my way to full system representation, but I've, now I've moved past that and I can either only focus on, you know, where do I have security impacts or where do I have uh, really valuable changes? Or I can, you know, move towards that, hey, this is way too accurate. I provided too much information inside of this item. So uh, in closing, right, the, the focus of this has been finding efficient ways to do threat modeling, right? Finding effective ways and defining what does effectiveness look like. Um, these things should be documented for your teams. Like we talk about uh, if you're on a flight, right? One of the things they found that the, the, the most valuable thing that it freed up time for flight attendants on flight was adding that little computer on your screen where you could see where the plane's at. Because it lets you know how far you have left. And people weren't like, excuse me, how much longer am I on this flight? Especially if you're talking about six and seven hour flights because now you have something to look at, right? Define what efficiency looks like. How long are we spending inside of these different steps? Define what effectiveness looks like and look what done. What does done look like in your threat model? Give people permission to stop. It's going to be okay that we haven't captured everything. I'm not expecting you to. I'm expecting you to generate five to seven threats for any given piece of component that are valuable, are gonna deliver value to the organization and are high impact items. I think I got a few minutes left for questions. Any questions? I know it's right before lunch, so we'll keep this brief. Yes, um, softballs only. <laughs> yeah, um, in relation to your definition of uh, what it is that we are aiming for, you only talked about mitigation. Do you not reckon that it would also bring value in order to open the eyes of the stakeholders in order to we have these kind of risks and now we decide that we are going to have to accept these risks? Or we might be transferring them to somebody else with a guiding solution or something like that. So risk acceptance doesn't make risk any lower, right? You know, so if I'm thinking about what's the outcome of an effective threat model, identifying risk I think is one of those, and, and that's part of the, but I think anything that's a, an accepted risk, especially not just a, a terminal accepted risk, should have some kind of corrective action plan attached to it as well, right? I have a timeline of when I'm going to address it, if I'm going to address it. I don't think there's a lot of terminal acceptance of risk, at least high level, high value in a short time frame threat model. Now, if you spend 10 hours generating threats, I think you're gonna find a lot of low level threats that, yeah, we're gonna accept and we're not gonna to touch. It costs too much to implement satisfactory protection on something that's a low value threat. Uh, and and the, the example I use is, you know, if I've, got a, if I've got a nice car, I've got street parking versus garage parking. How I protect my car is different in those environments. If it's in the garage, I may be less worried about someone running into it with their car, so I'm not gonna install bumpers around it. I don't know, some silly example. But different scenarios, different types of threats. Does that, does that answer your question, maybe? Yes or no? Yeah, well, uh, in order to uh, accommodate my question, uh, I, I, I'm thinking that some of the value that is created during a threat modeling session without X and if risk to be mitigated in the end would also be the value that is or the knowledge that's created Okay, so in that example, I would assume we're documenting something that already exists, right? Uh, could be. Okay, so right, with well, the different types of threat models. If I'm talking about pre-designed threat models, it doesn't exist yet. I'm laying out requirements. I'm translating business objectives to technical requirements to eventually design versus I have something that already exists. And, and in my opinion, that's probably one of the more challenging threat models because I've got a team over here who knows everything about their piece, a team over here that knows everything about their piece, but we don't really know how does data get exchanged between two different pieces. I think that is the most challenging example uh, because if you don't have the right person in the room, you could miss quite a bit. Um, and, and, and again, the best way to do that is to break that larger object into smaller pieces and having threat models for subcomponents, and having a security engineer then bring those together with experts from individual teams and talk about how data moves between different aspects of it. Uh, but I, I agree, I think that's the hard, especially when there's no documentation about how everything works together. Because you know, when I talk about creating a diagram in two hours, if I don't know what it looks like, I can't really create a diagram for it, right? I can't, I can't describe something I don't understand. So I think it's a valid, it's a valid point. Any other questions? Yes, sir. 
I can repeat your question back if it's easier. Um, you talked there about like the efficiency of, of the threat modeling, um, and I would wonder. This might be a bit of a cheeky question, but could you like go into how long or what the process looks like for a dev team at Ariat's risk? Like, what's your mean time to to go from a dev team that's implementing a new feature or system to going through your threat modeling process and then actually having actionable items to remediate? Like, what does that process look like? And, how are you measuring that? With, within our dev teams or within people using the product? With, within your dev teams? Presumably yeah. You're yeah, yeah. So w within our dev teams, I'm not sure we're probably measuring it at that scale. Yeah, I mean, we, they'll meet on an individual basis on you know, early in the week, generate the threat model within a couple days, build out the design requirements. But everything they're doing is pre designed, you know, because we've, I mean, obviously we maintain a registry of things we need to improve over time, right, as any company does. You're always going to have some kind of technical debt or things that need to be replaced, but I'm not sure we're measuring it to that degree. Because, uh, and I recognize, like, like we'll talk about uh, high ROI behaviors. Measuring the ROI of threat modeling is incredibly challenging, because no one's measuring that kind of data today. You know, this isn't manufacturing. Right? We're not measuring uh, time inside box. And why I like time box because it gives you a maximum number, not a, I have to go through and create a quantitative value for every single step and every single item. That's very challenging and you're not gonna see a ton of value from that for a long time. Uh, and I'll, by the way, I, I don't know about you guys, I hate tracking my own time. So imagine asking all of your developers to track how much time you're spending in every single activity you're working in. So I, I don't know if that's gonna drive the value I want, I prefer to approach that from what maximizes my ROI over time. What behaviors do I want to put in place? So, so I don't have an exact number for you. I don't think it's worth measuring to that degree. Good cheeky question. Any other questions? All right, cool. Thanks, guys.